Hello, my name is Chris Graham. I'm a urologist with Urology San Antonio. And today I'm going to be talking about bladder infections in women after menopause. So bladder infections occur in all age ranges. They're more common as we age, and they're particularly common in women as they age. This is particularly true after menopause, and there's several reasons for this. So after women go through menopause somewhere around 50, give or take, uh, within a few years, unless they've had a surgical um, menopause because they've had their ovaries removed at a younger age. Prior to about uh, 2000, it, most women ended up on estrogens at least for a time. Uh, studies that have linked estrogen and progesterone used together with an increased risk of breast cancer uh, radically changed the number of women that were on estrogens post-menopause, and so most women now are not on estrogens unless there's a particular reason uh, why they should be. So with that, the vagina, which relies on estrogens, loses its function, it thins out, it loses its blood supply, and the natural moisture that uh, keeps the vagina healthy uh, diminishes over time, and the vagina dries and it becomes more susceptible to the wrong bacteria living there. So in younger women, the predominant bacteria is lactobacillus, and there's a number of different forms of it, but a, uh, a number of the types of lactobacillus are the healthy, good bacteria that live vaginally. After menopause, then as the vagina thins out, the predominant bacteria becomes those of the colon or those of the intestines. So the, uh, even with, with good hygiene, just the, the anus being very close to the vaginal entrance, the bacteria are, are going to be present on and around the vagina, and that becomes the, the bacteria, the types of bacteria in the uh, stool or in the feces becomes the predominant bacteria that grows in the vagina. Now, the vagina is right next to the bladder, and the bladder drains right at the entrance of the vagina. So whatever bacteria are around the vaginal entrance are in close proximity to the bladder, and those are the bacteria that are just through the rate of the daily activities of living, and especially with intercourse, end up in the bladder. Normally, they're washed out as the bladder drains, but the presence of, of the bacteria from the intestines increases the likelihood that when bacteria do get in the bladder, a bladder infection will result. So the estrogens support good vaginal health, and without the estrogens present, the intestinal bacteria become the resonant bacteria of the vagina. So for many people, this isn't a problem whatsoever. They end up not having significant bladder symptoms. But in, in others, we'll get what are called occasional infections. So they'll end up anywhere from every couple of years to even a few times a year will develop the symptoms of a urinary infection. It's fairly simply treated, and uh, they can manage that problem. Uh, but if the number of infections increases and becomes more frequent, or if infections become harder to treat over time, then these should be managed not just with treating the infections, but also with some sort of prevention strategy. So one of the challenges is trying to figure out whether bacteria that it shows up in the urine on a urine, uh, on a urine sample is actually indicative of an infection or is just there as a what we call a colonizing bacteria. So the term that we use is asymptomatic bacteria. Asymptomatic means not having any symptoms. Bacteria is the presence of bacteria in the urine. There are a significant number of people that generally will have bacteria in the urine. Normally it's not there, but if it's in the urine but isn't invading the wall of the bladder, then there's not an infection present. The problem is that uh, there's also the, the, the condition where if you give a urine sample, the urine, especially as it, it, as it uh, crosses the vaginal entrance, can pick up bacteria from the vagina. So when the specimen's looked at, it's impossible to tell whether the bacteria is coming from the bladder itself 
or was a contaminant from the way the specimen was collected. So unless we actually use a catheterized specimen where we actually put a catheter into the bladder and, and, and take a specimen that can't get any vaginal contamination, it can be difficult to figure out whether what looks like an infection is actually coming from the vagina or the bladder itself. Then even if we know that the, it's a clean specimen, the bacteria may or may not be causing any problem. So again, the presence of bacteria without infection generally does not need to be treated. Uh, especially as people get older, bacteria uh, in the bladder is common, but also an infection may not have any symptoms that we normally associate with a bladder infection. The burning with the urination, the increased frequency, the pain down in the bladder area may not occur. The only signs of infection might be fatigue, confusion, loss of appetite. And so if we don't know whether the bacteria is, act it may just be a common bacteria that's present there routinely. So if a person is being evaluated for these symptoms of fatigue, loss of appetite, uh, or then and a urine specimen is taken, it may always show bacteria and the assumption is that it's coming from a urinary infection. And that may not be the case. And so it, it's, a, uh, it's a gray area to try to decide whether the presence of bacteria should be treated simply because it's there. Recommendations are that it's not unless it's causing symptoms, but the symptoms, as I said, can be rather subtle and difficult to associate with the bladder. So if someone's having multiple infections, we'd like to have some sort of a prevention strategy. The most effective prevention strategy, long term, or at least the one that, that, that I like the best, is to try to restore vaginal health. Because if we can restore the vaginal health, get the good lactobacillus to grow vaginally instead of the intestinal bacteria, then the number of infections will likely go down. One of the um, first, most important uh, parts of this treatment is to get across the idea that cleaner is not better. We think that if we wash away that bad bacteria, vaginal cleanliness will actually improve things. That's not the case because the soaps and the types of uh, formulas, even ones that are designed for, for the vagina, such as douches, what they do is they wash away the normal bacterial, the, the normal uh, surface of the vaginal wall, and they wash away the good bacteria. And then in the vacuum that's, that's created by that, the intestinal bacteria will grow. So the more that uh, women try to manage their own vaginal health with, with uh, using soaps, and with cleanings actually makes the problem worse for a number of people. A second technique is to go ahead and try to restore the, back, the good bacteria. So there's a number of probiotics. If you go to a health store, there's inexpensive lactobacillus probiotics and they're very expensive ones. And there's some that are designed for women and they tend to be the more expensive. I don't know that they're better, they might be, but I don't have any indication that that's necessarily the case. But most of those are taken orally. Well, the lactobacillus doesn't get from the intestines into the vagina. It doesn't jump across the, uh, through the bloodstream. The only way for it to get there would be to actually make its way through the intestinal tract and then make it across the skin around the anus into the vagina, which doesn't seem to be a very efficient way of getting the lactobacillus vaginally. So there's not a lot of good studies along this line, but what I recommend using is the lactobacillus um, given vaginally. And so there is one product out there. It's, it's a, I think it's about a dollar a piece, and it's, it has a, what's called a trochee, which is a little vaginal insert that has the lactobacillus in it, inserted vaginally, and then as it uh, dissolves or melts, then it actually helps the lactobacillus to grow in the vaginal area. What I'll recommend as a less expensive alternative is to actually just take a lactobacillus capsule, open up the capsule, pour the powder out onto the counter, and then just after the woman gets out of the shower, wet, just use wet a finger, roll it in the powder, and just insert it vaginally and wash your hands afterwards and do that about once a week. Again, I don't have a good study to show that that seems to be effective, but it's worked for a number of people. And it makes sense to me that by trying to restore the lactobacillus, it can actually improve the vaginal bacteria and reduce the number of infections.
It's part of the, the strategies that I use on a regular basis. There's a number of vaginal moisturizers, uh, which can help with vaginal irritation, medicines such as Vagisil. Uh, they may help to reduce symptoms, but to my knowledge, they don't actually change the bacterial content and reduce the risk of infections. So, vaginal estrogens, so if, if this problem predominantly occurs after menopause, then, and it occurs because of the lack of estrogens uh, promoting and supporting vaginal health, then restoring estrogens actually makes sense. And, and we're using it more and more, especially as we've gotten, we're seeing more women who are having this problem never having been on estrogens. So traditionally, estrogens have been given either by mouth or as a patch where it gets into the bloodstream, and a small part of that actually ends up vaginally. So what we're using more is to actually use a vaginal approach to, to estrogens. Medications such as estrase cream and premarin cream are the most common but there's also a ring that can be inserted and left for 90 days that just slowly allows the medicine to, um, uh, there's just slow exposure over the course of the 90 days. Uh, also, compounding pharmacies can make a, an estrogen compound and the price can vary uh, from very little to, to modestly expensive. But these medications are inserted either once to, to uh, three times a week. Initially, I'll even use it every day and just a small amount of the cream can either can be applied with an applicator or for many women they find it simpler just to put a little bit on their finger and insert it vaginally after they've showered. And over the course of about three months, it increases the vaginal thickness, it starts to promote the normal secretions, and once those secretions uh, are just naturally occurring, what that does is it promotes the good bacterial growth, the lactobacillus, and helps keep the bacteria away that tend to cause bladder infections. So I, I often will use the image of a field. If you see a piece of land that's all full of weeds and you want to grow a nice um, grass lawn on it, what you need to do is to, first of all, condition the soil and fertilize it. That's what the estrogens do. And then applying the lactobacillus is seeding the good soil to help promote a healthy environment. Estrogens do have certain risks associated with them, which is one of the reasons why we've gotten away from using it. Uh, we know that the study that, that really showed the definite link to breast cancer used estrogens and progesterones orally. And the two taken together uh, seemed to increase the risk from about 10% to about 12%. That's, it was that study that, that uh, changed the patterns of use of estrogens in women. Um, when we use them vaginally, there is some uptake into the body. The levels in the blood tend not to be as high as if you've taken the medicine by mouth, but there still is an uptake. We do not know if that increases the risk of breast cancer or not, but certainly the risk, the potential risk is there and that needs to be uh, discussed and considered. Uh, if the uterus is in place, then there's also an increased, uh, a slightly increased risk of uh, uterine cancer as well something called endometrial cancer. And the final point I'll make is, is that estrogens have been associated, as many hormones have, with a slight increased risk of uh, blood vessel events, uh, what are called blood clots that can rarely be uh, significant, um, and even potentially heart attacks. So they are potential threats, and it's just something that, that's part of what we have to use to weigh the benefits of not having the infections uh, and also potentially the improved sexual experience for people that are sexually active if they want to be on the estrogens. And um, so the estrogens work very well along that line. The other way that we tend to treat for prevention is to use antibiotics. So the estrogens are more of about a prevention. The antibiotics we can either use in any one of the three ways I mentioned initially. We can use it just to treat whenever someone is, uh, has an infection. And so if someone's having a rare infection, they can just call up, try to get an appointment, come see us, we'll check the urine and make sure it's an infection and treat if appropriate. If people have had a number of infections, I'll sometimes just give them a prescription. They can just have the prescription at home and if they feel an infection's occurring, they can just take the antibiotic and, and try to reduce the nuisance of having to get a hold of us, get in the office. And if someone's having a couple of infections a year, uh, I find that to be an effective way to help uh, keep them free from the bother of infections. 
And if the infections are occurring more commonly, I like to do more to prevent them. And if, if, if we're not using the vaginal strategies, then what I'll do is actually put them on a, a dose of preventative estrogens. And there's two, or I'm sorry, preventative antibiotics. And the two ways that I do that will be to give them a low dose daily antibiotic, usually about a quarter strength, uh, which they'll take. And that, I've had some people go years without infections. Others, it doesn't work as well. And the other option is for people that are sexually active just to take the pill after intercourse. So after sex, get up, empty the bladder, and then take the one pill. Since it's during intercourse that the bacteria are most likely to get in the bladder, especially if their infections tend to occur after sex, it's a very successful way of being able to manage many people. So in general, as people age, they're more likely to get infections. It's a, a particular problem in some women after menopause, and we can manage it either with using antibiotics when needed, to use them on a more regular basis to try to prevent, or to try to manage vaginal health and get rid of the problem from that level. I thank you for your attention.